I'm going to start out with a little teaching about our trip from Israel, and then Gary's going to help me with the second part of the teaching, then I'm going to close with another teaching. So tonight's just kind of go on a tour with us, and let's look and see. But I want to get you ready for what's coming next, because after Easter, um, there's Pentecost. And Pentecost is the empowerment of the church. And it's regrettable that too few Christians in the 21st century are living with that same Pentecost power. But we need that power of God. So what God has taught us in Mexico, we're going to just share with everybody else. How many people know that it's all about the anointing? The, right, the, the, spirit of, the Spirit of God has given it as a gift to the church, and everything we do is about anointing and how to let that anointing in and flow through us. And so that's where we're going to go for a few weeks after today. Today will be kind of lighthearted and teaching and travel. Who doesn't like a vacation and a little travel? But I want to get you ready to be a little more intense and intentional because we know that God today is moving by his spirit in a very intentional and a very direct way. He's not moving in every direction. You have to find out which atmosphere the spirit of God wants and then let him move in that atmosphere. So we're going to go there next week. We're going to talk about empowerment and power and anointing. Today, um, Gary and I want to share just a little bit about uh, our trip to Israel. We had about six weeks to put this trip together. We didn't. I mean, we just got to be part of it. But Doc's brother, Colonel John Somerville, called me a couple months ago and said, would you like to put together a trip with pastors who have never been to Israel? And so... I said, I'll be glad to do that. He said, the Ministry of Tourism is going to underwrite about 60% of the trip. And they want first-time pastors who have never been there before, but people who would come back enthusiastic and present Israel. And hopefully that would boost tourism. Well, the next call I got, (laughs) after I called a lot of friends and pastors, the next call I got was, oh, this is only a trip for pastors and not wives. So I had to call back and apologize to a few people. But... We ended up pulling together, I think he had like 23 pastors, an odd number, but he needed an even number. So he calls one afternoon and he said, you know, um, we need one more person. Would Kim be willing to go? Yeah, so, uh, you know, how, how many people are blessed with the opportunity to go to Israel and then have your wife with you? And then be amongst a whole bunch of pastors. And, uh, you know, John wears his big cowboy hat. And little did we know that half the pastors were going to be pastors from a cowboy church. And that's why they're, they're cowboys. And they were, they were talking about roping and bucking and, and bronking and, and Jesus. And then they talked about some more roping and Jesus. And then they talked about corrals and, and the bronc that nobody could ride and Jesus. So... We had a great, great time getting, getting to know, really get to know. But this wasn't a vacation. I mean, the colonel took us morning, noon, and night, and he just packed in as much as he could pack in so we could see as much as we could see and experience. So all I could do is just give you a little taste of some things. And if, if we, arrived, uh, we arrived in uh, David Ben-Gurion Airport, would you do slide number one? David Ben-Gurion Airport is in Tel Aviv, and Tel Aviv is the banking and financial capital of Israel. Israel is just a small country. You can get, I'm amazed. Stephen told me everything is accessible, and it just is smaller than you think, and it was smaller. But to the, but to the, the north and the west of Jerusalem, there's Tel Aviv, a very modern city, and uh, behind me, that's one that actually is uh, St. Peter's Church in Joppa. And Tel Aviv is the new city. And Joppa, of old, that ancient city Joppa, remember Jonah and the whale? Um, you got a modern city connected to an ancient biblical city. So behind me at night here, that's the, the city of Tel Aviv all lit up. So be, behind me in this next slide is Tel Aviv behind me, but it's like the, the Bay of Joppa. 
Behind me is the Bay of Joppa. Now, it's kind of like a semicircle, and in the far side of the circle to my right, that's Tel Aviv. And it, it bends over behind me, the bay behind me, is Joppa. But right in the center, there's this big gateway that years and years ago, in the days of Solomon, Solomon declared Joppa as the seaport of Jerusalem. And this is how Solomon got the cedars of Lebanon, way north of here, felled. The king of Lebanon cut a deal with Solomon, or Solomon cut the deal with the the king of Lebanon. And they cut down these great cedars, and they floated them down the river to the open ocean. They gathered them, kind of like, you know, herding cats or something, but they herded these big cedars. And they herded them right here to the Bay of Joppa. And from here, they went to Jerusalem to build the temple, Solomon's temple. So this place just has great, 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 great history. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Behind me uh, in the city of Joppa is the house of Simon the Tanner. Now, it may not be and probably is not the exact house of Simon the Tanner, um, but this is the location. Uh, behind this house is the beach and then the ocean, the Mediterranean. And so we got to stand, we got a couple of shots of this, we got to stand at this door and just think about it. It just was amazing how it would flood our mind about the history of this particular place. Remember, this is the place where Peter visited Simon the Tanner. It was in the early church, and the early church was just discovering what this Christianity was all about. They didn't know the rules, and they didn't know what God was going to do next. Here's a, a, a few outcasts in the, in the home of Simon the Tanner. And so Peter went to the home of Simon the Tanner to pray. Midday, he was hungry and went up on the the rooftop. And there on the rooftop, while he was hungry, remember the scene where there's a sheet down, come down out of heaven, and there's four corners on the sheet. This is significant in the, the church because the church had no idea what to expect next. Peter sees all these four-footed creatures, all of them unclean in the sheet, and the voice from heaven says, Peter, you can kill and eat. He says, I have never done that before. So I don't eat unless it's kosher. You know, we got got to figure out what kosher meant. We got fed real well. But there was no breakfast with ham, bacon, or sausage. There, There were no pork products. And so in this day... Peter says, I'm kosher, I'm clean. But Jesus has this incredible teaching just for Peter. The incredible teaching is, don't call anything at all anymore unclean if I've cleaned it and I say it's clean. He's setting Peter up to usher the Holy Spirit into the Gentile world. Uh, Peter doesn't understand it at this time. He just says, all right. Okay, clean, unclean, I'm not going to call it clean. So he's learning. The whole church is learning in the first century. I mean, we have so much advantage because we can look back and we have all the history and we have the Bible and we have so much resource. But then they didn't. They had to trust the Spirit of God. They had to just trust for the next revelation and find out what is Jesus going to do next. So while Peter is on the rooftop, A man by the name of Cornelius, a centurion, sent his soldier and two servants to come from Caesarea Maritime, where his home was, and walk all the way to Joppa and ask for Peter. They knock on the door, ask for Peter, and say, and said, the Lord has appeared to Cornelius and he has sent us for you. And he goes with them. I mean, that's pretty, to me, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty interesting. He doesn't know these guys. But he goes with him. He goes all the way up back to Caesarea. And we visited Caesarea Maritime. And it's north of Joppa, north of Jerusalem. It's north up there. It's a place where Herod had built an, 
an enormous mansion. He had built a, a tremendous theater. He had built a coliseum where chariot races took place. But in back of all the entertainment, there was a, there was a, a place for all of the soldiers who served Rome and served Herod. One of those places was a home of Cornelius, a servant. It says of Cornelius that he gave alms to God. He blessed the Jewish people. He built a synagogue. And he was the friend of the Jews. Now just keep that in mind for a minute. Peter goes to the house of Cornelius. And Cornelius greets him. And he says, it's good for you to come because you're not even supposed to be under my roof. I'm unclean and you're clean. And Peter says, well, uh, I got news for you. I just got a message from from God that I'm not going to call anything or anyone unclean. And Cornelius says, give us the gospel. Tell us, tell us what the Lord has told you and taught you. What Jesus has said to you, say to us. And he begins. And it's a pretty eloquent speech. You can read, I think it's Acts chapter 10, you can read it. He begins, and it sounds like it's going to be one of those great Pentecost sermons that Jesus, that Peter gave, but it's not. The Holy Spirit interrupts the sermon. He falls down upon all the Gentiles, and all the Gentiles start speaking in tongues and are baptized with the same spirit that the 120 were baptized with at Pentecost. And that 5,000 were baptized with later. And another 3,000 later. Now, it happens to the Gentiles. I mean, aren't you glad? Gentiles, aren't you glad? So this, this scene right here of just standing in the place where so much history took place, just pretty amazing. I would... David, David started to weep, and then one of the cowboys said, man, remember that, remember that bull? I could never ride that bull. <laughs> David said, it spoiled the moment for me. <laughs> he was so touched and so moved. But we were, we were just privileged to be here. Could you go to the next slide? Let's, let's go to the last one. Yeah, this slide. You talk about ancient, long before Peter has exalted vision at at Simon the Tanner's home, long before Peter gives the gospel in Cornelius' home, long before Cornelius and all of his household and servants received the Spirit of God, way back when, at this city, at this place, God said to a little prophet named Jonah, go to Nineveh and tell them, you've got 40 days. And this is the place where... Jonah went west instead of east. And last week I made reference to Jonah being thrown overboard and going down into the depths of the sea, and his prayer was a prayer as though he were dead. And Jesus makes the reference to Jonah, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So God uses this place. He uses Jonah to communicate one of the most important events. We'll, t- we'll end by talking about that event, Jesus, in the heart of the earth. Okay, so let's see what else we got. Let's go to, uh, forget this guy. Would you play that? And Gary, have you got some outer garments? We're here at a Jewish colony called Kadem. Kafa Kadem. There's a... Uh, 400 Jews here who established this colony 32 years ago it didn't exist but now 400 Jews have developed this colony with all the fruit trees and everything indigenous that was here in the land 2,000 years ago this is lower Galilee and the Jews here are only 20 percent of the population 80 percent are Arabic but the Jews feel that in order to inhabit the land that they will colonize area by area. And so this area for 32 years has been colonized. 
And so what you're about to see is how they really live on the land and how they lived on the land 2,000 years ago. Now just over there, 10 miles, is the city of Nazareth. To my left, 10 miles, is the city of Canaan. The city where Jesus was born is Bethlehem, but he grew up in Nazareth, and his first miracle was 10 miles away from here in Canaan. This is just amazing. So all of the tour were dressed like the times of old, and we've had, to, we've had the opportunity to experience how people would have lived in the days of Jesus. You're gonna find out more. Stick around, come on, follow me. We learned a lot. Why don't you talk about the, uh, the colony, and I'm gonna get dressed here, okay. okay. The Kofar Kadem colony, um, like Mike said, started about um, 32 years ago. And it's a place you can go to experience a day of how a typical, I mean, back at 6 AD, shepherd, farmer, Jewish citizen lived and what they wore and what they did in the events of farming, um, milking goats, making bread, you'll see slides here, and then taking that flour, mixing it with water, putting it on a hot pan and making your pita right there, and then having fresh olive trees press oil and the grind and then to spread that on the bread. And, and, we, and we did all that. And it was a, just, um, I found it to be a very humbling um, place to be in. Uh, Menachem was the uh, guy that was talking to us. There he is. He was absolutely hilarious, um, but just a really strong Jew. And what I gained was, Marianne asked me when I came back, so they say when you go to Israel, you come back different. And so one night we're sitting there and she goes, so, are you different? <laughs> I said, no, sweetheart, it, it's still me, but I have a much more deeper respect for the nation of Israel and a much more deeper respect for the people, the Jewish people, as a people, for their long suffering. And if you, if you look at the history of where they've come from, it, it's amazing. So in, in, in Kafar Kadem, there was just a reverence that they went through those two guys. There, there was a reverence in everything that they did, from getting up to praying to even dressing. So while they're dressing, they're saying a prayer. While they're grinding the bread, they're saying a prayer. While they're, whatever they're doing, they're in worship. You know, worship doesn't have to be about singing songs. They, they are in worship constantly with everything that they're doing to be in fellowship with God. And, that, and you could feel it here. And I think you experienced that too. Yeah, I mean, they just kind of drew us in to where they brought us back to a colony that they began 32 years ago to replicate the days of Jesus. So the fruit trees, the persimmon trees, the fig trees, the, the pomegranate trees, everything was planted in accordance with the days of Jesus. Everything we did is what would have happened back there. And the way that we're dressed is the way that they were dressed back there. And part of the dress, whether it's an undergarment or an outer garment, they would have four corners. There's four corners to it. So the significance of these four corners is Abraham's promise that God said to Abraham, everywhere the sole of your foot will tread, I will give it to you for an inheritance. North, south, east, and west. So for them to remember the covenant promises to Abraham, they, they have different traditions, and this is one of the tra traditions. Their dress reminds them of God's promise to give Abraham every square foot where his foot treads, north, east, south, and west. Yeah, Kim, go to the next slide. There's Kim with a... So we got to experience you know, holding <clears throat> lambs and, and goats around, around our, our neck, and even milk a goat, and uh, he did. I, I put this guy on, and he gave me a little kiss, and then he went back. So there's, there's a, a, a mill grind, uh, an actual mill grind, where they dump the, 
the flour, the seeds of the grain on top. And you pack it down, and then you just start turning the mill grind. And you get this dust, and you keep packing the seeds. And then you get some water, and you make your flour. And then you throw it on the pan. And it turns into a pita. I love pita. I fell in love with falafel and pita. And then you get to experience what Monacum does an actual eight day journey to, is it Nazareth? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. A pilgrimage. Eight days it takes them. Now that's how long it took Jesus. And the, what I also discovered and realized was that Jesus and the disciples, they were in shape. Because these guys hoofed it everywhere. And they traveled miles and miles and miles between the cities. So it would take eight days by donkey walking to go from Kadath Kadam, which is up by the Sea of Galilee, just outside Nazareth, to Jerusalem. And Menachem does that with tour groups, with donkeys, and you walk, and you sleep outside, and you just live off the land. And There's some real beautiful land, but there's some real, real rugged like a territory. So I just got a deep respect of Jesus and the disciples. Man, they, they were in shape. Yeah. <clears throat> now, somebody, somebody asked us where Nazareth is. You can see... <laughs> Which way are we going? Yeah, we, we agreed. You've heard of the Wright brothers. Well, these are the wrong brothers. <laughs> but that was the mode of transportation for the day. And so we just were treated to just everything that would have happened then we got to step back into time. Yeah. Now, I, I don't think we have a, a picture of the threshing room floor. But Menachem went to a threshing room floor and he says, there are things we do just because God says to do them. We don't question why. We just do it because God says to do it. And he says, the first thing God told us to do is to leave the land alone and give the land a rest every seventh year. He said, we don't ask God why to, leave the, why to leave the land at rest of the seventh year, because God says so, we do that. But he says, throughout the generations of our people, God had provided three times more in the sixth year, preparing us to be well fed while we let the land rest the seventh year. He said, if you think about our Sabbath, our Sabbath is sundown every Friday. And it ends sundown on Saturday. And he's telling us about the Sabbath. He's telling us about the land even getting a rest on the seventh year. In fact, in, in hotel rooms, I, I'd, I'd walk into the elevator on the Sabbath and kind Jews would go, ooh, Shabbat, Shabbat. This is a Shabbat elevator. You don't, you don't do any work, so you don't push a button. Right, Doc? Remember? You, you don't push the button. That's unnecessary servile work. And the elevator goes up one floor at a time so you don't have to push a button. Stores are closed. Restaurants won't serve you. You prepare your food the day before. And it's all in honoring God. But Menachem said, if you think about our Sabbath, this is the day when the father spends the entire day with the entire family. The father gets to pour out what he knows and what he's been taught about God and the land and his ways and his principles, his commandments. He says, every Sabbath, we're the father to the entire family. Then he said, when it comes to the seventh year rest, the Sabbath for the land, he said, just think about it. God gave us a whole year to spend with our family. That's pretty good devotion. I thought that was so cool that it's very, very family-centered. And if you remember, when, when God appears to Abraham, and he's on his way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, shall I withhold from Abraham the thing that I'm about to do? No, I won't, because I know Abraham will raise his family and his household well. It means so much to God that we take care of our family and our wife and our kids. So he's communicating this as he's talking to us about giving the land a rest. Then he talked about <clears throat> threshing out the grain. So there was a donkey there, and the donkey would be used to thresh out the grain. But remember the, remember the saying that says, don't muzzle the ox that treads out the grain? <coughs> he, 
he's saying, we don't put bits in the donkey's mouth. <coughs> we put a bag, <coughs> excuse me, we put feed in front of the donkey, so he's motivated to continue working and thresh out the grain. He says, why did God tell us to do that? And nobody really had a great answer until out of right field somebody says, <coughs> because it would be abuse. He says, exactly. And what are you abusing when you put a bit in a donkey's mouth? He says, you're abusing his mind. I never thought of it like that before. You're abusing his mind. And so God is thoughtful about the animal world and was thoughtful in training Israel to take care of the land, to take care of the animals, and most important, to take care of their family. <coughs> if, you'll, if you'll turn that on, Well, we're in Nazareth. In just a moment, we're going to pan around, and you'll get a chance to see what Nazareth looks like all grown up 2,000 years from the time of Jesus. We know that 2,000 years ago, when Jesus grew up in Nazareth, it was a time of devotion or devoted. Uh, his stepfather, Joseph, was devoted to his learning his trade. He became a carpenter. Uh, Nazareth was just a very small village with maybe more relatives than not living in it. Uh, Jesus grew up faithfully here. We believe, scholars believe, at the age of 18 and 19, his stepfather, Joseph, died, and he was the he was the man of the house, devoted to taking care of the family, his mother and his brothers and sisters. Uh, as a carpenter, he grew up here in Nazareth. He prepared his life for ministry here in Nazareth. I don't think anybody knows exactly where it is, but I want to read a text of Scripture to you because when he began his ministry, he walked into the synagogue, and as he walked into the synagogue, this is what happened. Jesus returned in power by the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went throughout all the region. So he came back to Nazareth, where he had been raised, and his custom was to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he did. He stood up. He was handed the book, or the scroll, of the prophet Isaiah. When he opened it, he found this place, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those things that are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the scroll, gave it back, and sat down. And all the eyes were upon him. And he says this, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He went on to explain that in the days of Elijah, the only people who got help was a, a Syrian, someone out of the country, and they were furious. And in their fury, they took him, marched him out of the synagogue, and took him to what's called a precipice or a high place. This is the only precipice in Nazareth. What you're looking at is the precipice of the hill where most likely he was paraded and taken up and presumably would have been thrown over, but it said he simply walked back through the midst of them and walked away. This is the only precipice in Nazareth. I would bet this is the place where they brought Jesus. This is the place he walked back through the crowd, back to Capernaum, where he headquartered his ministry. Come on, let's go take a look. I don't know how many hours of teaching, video teaching that we have, but we're going to post all of these. We'll edit them first, then post them on our website, so legendsoffaith.net. So we'll, we'll put these in a gallery, and then we'll kind of categorize them. But I have one more little teaching that absolutely so inspired me. Do we have, do we have anything that we can pull up about the temple, Herod's temple, um, the Temple Mount. If you do get it, that's great. If you don't get it, let me just narrate this for you. 
Uh, Gary and Kim and I took two and a half to three hours out of the tour, and we cut out those hours, and we went to the, the temple. We went into Jerusalem, and behind me was Herod's temple. Now, formerly on that spot, it was Solomon's temple. Years later, it was the temple of Zerubbabel. But when Herod the Great, and I mean Herod the Great, he believed himself to be pretty great, he made a temple that was just out of sight and spectacular, gold inlaid all over the place. So behind me is the picture of the temple and the temple mount. On the temple mount is the dome, that golden dome, the dome of the rock. Underneath that dome, there's a huge rock, and our guide just took us through this, this piece of information. And she said, that rock is believed by tradition to be the, the, the starting place of creation. She said, from some, she said, from some composite, she thinks something started there. Jerusalem is built on a mountain. It's called Mount Moriah. And I start looking into Mount Moriah when I was there. And if you remember, Mount Moriah was the place where God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, who you love, and I will show you where to go. And he leads them on a three-day journey, and they end up on Mount Moriah, the place where Jerusalem now is built. And there, Abraham and Isaac build an altar. And you know the story that God intervenes, saves Isaac, and provides a ram for sacrifice. But Abraham was willing to go through with it. Later in Genesis, Jacob journeys to a a place... And God stops him, and he stops him on top of Mount Moriah. He pulls up a rock, puts his head down, and he dreams of this ladder. And there are angels ascending and descending. That happens on Mount Moriah. The temples, Solomon's temple, Herod's temple, is right there on Mount Moriah, and the Holy of Holies which was the Holy of Holies, is the place now where the dome is, the golden mosque. One morning I woke up, three times I woke up, and I woke up with the same, I don't know if it was a vision or a dream, and I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't get the thought, I didn't try to, I just couldn't get the thought out of my head. Could it be that the cradle of civilization was on Mount Moriah and that's why God regards that piece of property, that real estate, so important to him. Is that why the devil wants it so badly? Is that why that area is the most contested place on the planet? And the Jews will tell you, if anybody wants to rule the world, they have to take Jerusalem. What makes that real estate so just incredibly valuable? Not not dollar-wise, far deeper, spiritually valuable. When I woke up and had this thought three times, <clears throat> well, I'll tell you the thought was, <clears throat> that the Garden of Eden was in Mount Moriah, that God created Adam and Eve on Mount Moriah, and God went up and down the ladder, and in the cool of the day, walked with Adam, walked with Eve. I thought, could it be that the tree of life would have been where the Holy of Holies was and God regards that spot as the most precious spot on earth and where creation took place at that spot and that's where God ascended and descended into heaven? I don't know. So I went to our tour guide who knows everything. <clears throat> she is so informed. She's well educated in archaeology and history and geology and art and <clears throat> I've never met anybody quite like this lady. I said, let me tell you a dream that I had. And when I told her, she said, oh, you're a deep thinker. I said, no, I just went to sleep and woke up three times. (laughs) 
She said, I have a book for you, and it's scholars from the University of Tel Aviv and Hebrew University who have been examining this very thing for years, and they've written a book with their findings, and she's sending me a copy of this book. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, you know, I don't know, I can't tell you, but I thought to myself, I, I, I just wasn't able to shake these thoughts, and who knows, you know, God can speak in visions and dreams. He's done it before, not really frequently, but he's done it before. But what? What an, almost a surreal Standing there on the place that could be the cradle of civilization, the starting place of it all, but something significant, so many things significant happen on that X marks the spot. <clears throat> it's what we believe in the passion of Jesus, the death on the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, what he purchased for us, our redemption and salvation all happened on Mount Moriah. Could that be a special place in God's heart? Roger? Oh, God is so good. Father, we just come to you as we close this amazing service that we learned about Israel and where you walked and where you preached, Father. And we thank you that you are real and you are alive, Father, today in our lives. Father, thank you that uh, you... You gave up your life so that way that we could have hope and life and a new beginning through your Holy Spirit, Father. And we just ask that as we leave here today, that we take every promise that you have for us in your word, and we would apply it to our lives in such a way that we would live the kind of life that you called us to live here on this earth. Father, we thank you for what you did. You are an amazing God, and we... We're just in awe of you. And Father, as we hear about these teachings that uh, you, you did, Father, we're just, um, we just want to soak it in. As we leave here, we just ask, Father, that uh, you protect each and every person, each and every family. Father, as we go through this week, Father, we thank you for your blessings in advance, for your mercies and your grace. And, Father, just how good you are. And we look forward to spending the week with you, Father. Our, our time with you doesn't end here. It's just a beginning. It's just a refresher. Father, so we thank you. And we just, um, we thank, uh, we, we just can't thank you enough, Father, for how glorious you are. We just pray these things in your mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said. God the Father.